Hey. hey. Oh, hi. Calling Chris Anderson in London. I, I'm still in London, yes. And calling Rick Byer in Chicago. But you're in a different room I'm, in London. Are you I know. Like in, uh, are you in a Novotel? Yeah. <laughs> well, I missed a Novotel, so I, I thought I'd look I'd try to set up my living room to look like a oh, Novotel. Oh nice, nice. Yeah. So and you're in your new, living room. Yeah. Are you oh, actually what? in Chicago or are you just pretending that you're in Chicago? Well, we're we're both pretending right now because who knows where we really are because we're introducing an on card episode, but I am I, at the moment of recording this, I am in Chicago. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Welcome everybody to History Happy Hour brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours from you know, every war you can imagine and on and many more. continents. Yeah, and, and more. more. Yes. Wars that you never knew took place. Yeah. And even tours that aren't about wars, although they kind of still get wars yeah. in them. And that's how you can check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast. Thank you for joining us. And today we're going to be uh, rebroadcasting an Encore episode with uh, one of our favorite authors, Lynn yes. Olson. Yeah, excited yes. about that. Uh, let us all know you're here and what you're Espe drinking. Oh. Especially if you're a, a Lynn Olson groupie, because I know we got lots of. And we do have Lynn Olson groupies. Yeah. Call yourselves out. Let let yes. yourself let people know that you're a Lynn Olson groupie. I'm I'm one, <laughs> and uh, and and I think Chris is not far behind on that score. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do all that. And Chris, do you have a cocktail today? Uh, um, I don't because, well, it's, it's not cocktail hour yet. Ah, uh, well, it's always good. Look at that. Look at that. What are you drinking? Yeah, what are you drinking, Rick? Uh, the straight stuff. Um, straight from Lake Michigan. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Well, filtered, I would hope. <laughs> It's not straight from Lake Michigan. Uh, we want to thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, especially our top shelf patrons. And you can help heap, keep, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Beep, 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 beep. You can help keep the history taps running by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash history happy hour. We haven't had anybody join as a patron in the last few weeks. Getting a little sad. That, uh, that, uh, maybe, not loved. Yeah. That, that we're not feeling the patron love so if you're out there and you've been thinking about it maybe you can give us some some patron love <laughs> um so you're still, you, that means you're still ankle deep in hats doesn't it yeah so yeah, no, i got uh, lots of hats yeah okay. so we got a history happy oh you're right if you become a top shelf patron you do get a history happy hour hat and it's you know lovely and filled with our logo Appears in a in, in a very appropriate uh, place. Maybe you should hat. maybe you should do a special though, like if if um, a like special a about the hats. Well, I mean, if if you become a patron, like within a certain amount of time, we'll get a pin on the hat. Oh, oh I like that. You know, I, I was thinking you meant we should do a special, like a special program that could be all about the hats. I don't know. Yeah. I don't the think long, we could... torturous process of coming up with that. I don't. <laughs> I don't think that we could manage to do more than three or four minutes on the hats before we started to lose. Oh, well, we could talk about how we planted the seeds, cultivated them, grow them, harvest them. You know, well, it's... All oh, right, anyway. Chris, I think Moving we've on. filled yeah. enough time here. So yeah. uh, why don't you give me a cue to get us the hell on the move? <laughs> The bar is open. Christiane de Roche Noble Corps was a real life uh, Indiana Jones who went toe to toe with the Gestapo in World War II and then embarked on an extraordinary campaign to save ancient Egyptian temples from floodwaters created by the Aswan Dam. She was fearless and tireless, and author Lynn Olson has brought her to life in the new book, Empress of the Nile. Uh, the daredevil archaeologist who saved Egypt's ancient temples from destruction. Lynn Olson is a New York Times bestselling author of, I think, nine books of history, if I can count right. Uh, uh, I think I got that right. Many of which deal in some way with World War II. She was on the show three years ago to talk about her book, Mer uh, Madeline, excuse me, I'm, I am losing it here, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Madame Fourcade's Secret War. War. Uh, many of you know that she is one of my favorite authors, uh, and Chris's as well. So welcome, Lynn Olson. Welcome back. Hey, Lynn. Welcome Thank back. You. I'm delighted to be back. Welcome back to oh, History yeah. Happy Hour. So, so your book is about uh, a, a French Egyptologist who you say is a daredevil in mm -hmm. the um, 
in the uh, subtitle of the book. You call her a female Indiana Jones. So this sounds like a really fascinating person, somebody I certainly hadn't really come across until I read your book. Tell us just to give us a start, give us an overview of her and um, you know how this story caught your attention, because it's kind of different from a lot of the other stories that you've done that have been sort of World War II centric. Right, yeah. Um, I ran across her accidentally. I was, uh, after I wrote Madame for Cause Secret War, which is about a, um, uh, they had the only woman to head a major French resistance organization during the war. Um, I was being lazy and thought, okay, I'm going to maybe do another book on World War II and spies. And I ran across this group uh, that was really the first French uh, resistance organization in Paris um, after the fall of, of France to Germany. Uh, and what really interested me was that it was a group of intellectuals. It was almost all, they were writers, they were museum curators, they were anthropologists. Um, and uh, the other thing that was really interesting is that women played a huge role in its organization and its creation. Um, so I, I started looking into it and looking at the women in particular. And I discovered in doing that, um, one particular young uh, resistance member, a, a member of that group, and she was at the Louvre. She was an archeologist. Her name was Christiane de roche noble -Corp. And she was the acting curator of the Egyptian antiquities at the Louvre. So during the week, she would work at the Louvre doing what she was supposed to be doing. And on the weekends at night, she was involved in the resistance, ris risking her life. Um, and so I was, I was really fascinated by that. And then the more I learned about her, the more I thought, oh my God, this woman, I never heard of her, uh, which was true of yeah. Mary Madeline Foucault too. I'd never, ever heard of her. And yet she had done so many incredible things, <clears throat> mostly after the war, mostly post-war. So at that point I decided, for, to forget about World War II, and although there is a lot, there is some about World War II in the book, but really focus on her and what she did throughout her life, particularly in Egypt after the war. So, I mean, one of the things that kind of I found fascinating about the book was not only is she a trailblazer, uh, being a woman at that point in time, getting into the field of archaeology, but she's kind of there at the ground floor of Egyptology as an even a subject. Right. Well, it, actually, Egyptology had been, you know, a very big subject in England and in France um, for a um, uh, hundred years, maybe right. before she got into it. But in, certainly in terms of the 20th century, she came in, she um, began her career as an Egyptologist in the 1930s. And so that was still kind of the, the tail end of the golden age of, of archaeology um, in Egypt. And uh, so she dealt with a lot of the very famous archaeologists. I mean, she worked under, uh, she didn't work under uh, Howard Carter, who discovered King Tut's tomb, but she worked under people who had worked with Howard Carter. So she um, she was very much a part of, of that group. And yet she, she was the only woman. She was the yeah. only, uh, she was the first prominent female archaeologist in France. That I mean, it was, it was, Archaeology, until really, you know, toward the late 20th century, was really still very much of a, a boys club. It was an old, yeah. you know, it was an old boys network. And uh, women were decidedly not um, wanted. And, and it was made very clear to them that, it, that they were not wanted. And so she was, she, you know, ran into, she was harassed and uh, uh, throughout her career, uh, right from the beginning. Because basically they said, you know, yeah. women are not allowed. Women are not to be here. And and how did she deal with that? I mean, you have a great quote uh, uh, about the uh, Egyptology world in France uh, in the 1930s, perhaps even about the same world today. Uh, uh, someone who calls it a very restricted community within which love of neighbor is not always the dominant feeling, which is kind of a funny way to say it. Uh, but how does she she deal with this? So she she's come up. She is she's educated at a at a school associated with the Louvre. She has some connections, but she's got a lot of um, 
you know, people kind of working against her. She's she's pretty brash, though, isn't she? Yes, I mean, she's yeah. not like a, a wallflower or, well, I'll just no. work around this. Yeah, you have, to, you have to understand her background. She came from a upper middle class background. Her father was a lawyer. Her mother had actually gone to college and had graduated from college, which was very rare at that time. And unlike most young French girls of her era, um, her parents encouraged her to do whatever she wanted. She was a very outgoing, very energetic, very enthusiastic young girl. And her parents said, good, fine. Um, and that was very, very unusual in France. So she grew up thinking that she was just as good as the boys, as her brother. Um, she, her brother had a big group of friends that she was part of. You know, you know, she was a little his little sister, but he included her in all of this. So she came from a very unusual family. And, and, and so she was not used to the idea that she couldn't do anything. I mean, because her parents had really told her that she could do whatever she wanted. Uh, and so she, you know, believed that. And even when she got into, you know, when she started studying archaeology and it was made very clear to her by her fellow students uh, that she wasn't supposed to be there, she refused to accept that. The good thing, you know, despite her problems with her colleagues, her male colleagues, is that many of the senior archaeologists um, who were training her or who were educating her saw what a brilliant uh, student and a brilliant um, archaeologist she was. So she did, she did have mentors uh, as she was going along. It was the people who were her own age uh, and maybe Man, slightly weird. older uh, that were really terrible, really, really terrible to her. I mean, you've got to understand Egyptology to this day, I think is true. Uh, it's a very small group. And there are not many really good jobs out there. There weren't back then. So there was incredibly fierce rivalry. Um, but the, but the, the, there was one story, um, I mean, just, just how petty this can be of, uh, uh, at, I guess it was at the school where the other students are complaining, well, but now if there's a woman here, we can't come down to breakfast in our pajamas. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. yeah, okay, really? That's really what this is yeah. about? That was in Cairo. She was the first uh, woman to be named a scholar at um, the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology, which is... Um, uh, you know, it, it's the elite research center, French research center in Egypt for the study of ancient Egypt. She was the first woman, and this was in the late 30s. Um, she was the first woman appointed. She was 23 years old. And they rose up in revolt. Um, the, the men who were there, her age, rose up in revolt and said they would not have her. They would not accept her because, yes, they couldn't come down in their uh, pajamas. It's a big deal for us being yes, able to come it, down in our pajamas for breakfast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they kept saying, though, she would die in the field, that she couldn't possibly survive in the field. Um, yeah, she lived to be, what, 93? She lived 97. Yeah. <laughs> and most of those years were spent in the field. I mean, yeah. she, she didn't retire until she was in her 80s. So she was uh, yeah. still very much an archaeologist. Yeah. So, you know, um, living here in London, as I do, we, we tend to think of, when we think of Egypt and archaeologists and, and Egyptology, it's, it's um, well. It's very British, yeah. uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was I was interesting to read your book because of of just how enmeshed in all of this France has been. Oh yeah, yeah. So maybe just talk a little bit about kind of France's connection to this whole story and why it's almost as important as Britain's connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, the French would argue that they are. Wait, 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 no, Chris. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all. Britain and France were the two main colonial powers, you know, in the 19th century and 20th century um, in, in various parts of the world, but particularly in the in North Africa and the Middle East. And archaeology has always been connected to colonialism. I mean, Britain and France uh, were the best known in terms of archaeology, and, and they sent their archaeologists over to Egypt as well as to other parts of, of the Middle East um, on digs, you know, and uh, to look for treasures that they could bring back to their museums. And so it was, it was all part of this, this um, to and fro between the two countries to outdo each other. Um, and so the French were very much 
as involved, even more involved in, in some ways than, than the British in Egypt in terms of archaeology. The French actually, Britain, you know, controlled Egypt politically for, um, you know, more than 100 years until 1952. Um, so that economically and politically, they controlled Egypt, but France was the cultural uh, power. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting that they were sort of... Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of culture, they were the, the French were basically in charge of archaeology in Egypt, not allowing the Egyptians to be part of it. I mean, right. because they, they were, you know, colonials. And, and so they, they basically ran the show. They, uh, they ran the antiquity service. They decided who was going to be allowed to dig. They decided which tre treasures um, they could take out. Um, so uh, the, the French, in terms of archaeology, were far more dominant in Egypt than the British. I mean, one of the, the great things about your book is just that, that there's so much packed in there about not just about Christian, but about international relations and about archaeology and about technology and about um, you know power struggles and and uh, and and all this uh, type of stuff. So so there's, you you get to go down a lot of different paths. Both you as as an author did, and 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 we as as readers get to. And and one of those paths is um, we 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 shouldn't, especially given our audience, we shouldn't leave out the World War II portion of this. Yeah. Uh, she's working at the Louvre, and she becomes part, as you said, of this interesting French resistance network, the Musée de l'Homme uh, mm -hmm. network, Musée de l'Homme being French for Museum of Mankind. Uh, and so so tell us about this network and about uh, her activities during World War II, both resistance, and she's also part of this whole trying to save the treasures of the, the Louvre. Right. Yeah. She, she had actually two functions in terms of the war. In the beginning of the war, uh, in, in 1939, uh, she was at the Louvre. She was a curator at the Louvre. Um, and the head of the Louvre, the director of the Louvre, Jacques Jarjard, decided to evacuate um, all the masterpieces. Uh, or in fact, you know, most, most of the important artwork and, and uh, antiquities uh, from the Louvre before the war began. Um, and... Um, so when war was declared, he had already planned this. And so, you know, truck <clears throat> load after truck load after truck load um, left the Louvre. And all these, this art and all these antiquities were taken to chateaus in the Loire Valley to protect them um, from the Germans coming in. And Christiane was part of that. She, she helped uh, pack up the Egyptian antiquities. Um, and um, then when the, the Germans did invade France and we're getting closer and closer and closer uh, to the Loire Valley. She, she and er went out uh, and brought, you know, made, I think three trips uh, from the Chateau in the Loire Valley where the antiquities were down to another Chateau in the South of France. And meanwhile, you have the German troops marching in, you have the German planes uh, attacking the refugees who were in, you know, uh, you know, flooding down to the South. Too. So, I mean, she was really taking her life in, in her hands well, as she, she, other she, curators. She's uh, in her mid-20s at this point, too. Or yeah, she's, she, she, she's 27 years old. She, no, yeah. maybe. No, no, she's not even that. She's 25 years old and all this. So she's in charge of, of these uh, convoys for the Egyptian antiquities and, and manages to get them down safely to this other chateau. Um, and then comes back to France, uh, comes back to Paris and um, decides she is going to resist the Germans and joins this group, um, the Museum of Man um, Network, and is part of, part of that. So, you know, she's doing that at the same time as she's still at the Louvre working. Um, the, the Louvre was interesting because there's a lot of resistance activities going on within the Louvre um, during that time. Um, so she's, she's there. Jacques Chargard, the director, knows that she's involved um, in resistance. He is as well. Um, and so she works, but then she also acts as a courier um, for um, this resistance network. And she gets she she gets captured by the Gestapo. Yeah, she does. She she's assigned. She's um, signed a mission to take some intelligence down to the south of France, which was in the unoccupied zone. 
Um, so she's on a train um, and crossing the border between the occupied northern part of France and then the south. And as it pulls into the city or the town of Moulin, um, a SS guy boards the train, comes to her compartment, knows who she is, asks to see her ID papers. She gives them to him and he yanks her off the train and puts her in a cell. Um, and basically, you know, they figured out that she was on that train and who she is. Um, she had the intelligence um, in her glove. Um, she, if she put it, she folded it up and put it, you know, in her glove under a finger. I mean, in her finger. Um, so, and, and so she's interrogated, she's brought in and interrogated, but Christiane, <laughs> as I said, she was not afraid of anybody. She would not allow any man to uh, treat her uh, without the respect she thought she she deserved. So anyway, she comes into this, she's escorted into this uh, room uh, and finds like five or six uh, SS guys um, with their feet on the table, on the desk, smoking cigars and she comes in and they start interrogating her uh, they don't get up they don't do anything they start interrogating her and they and they ask you know and, and she refuses to to answer she refuses to tell them um they ask her if she knows german she does know german but she said she, you know she didn't uh, she absolutely refused to cooperate with them and as the interrogation went on she got angrier and angrier because she was these were the kind of guys she had to deal with <laughs> you know, in Paris. Um, and, and so she had finally had it. And um, then she started screaming at them saying, you know, how, how badly they had been brought up because, you know, my God, you know, to, to keep your boots on the table when a woman walks in, you know, that's, that's beyond the pale. And, yeah. and so they were dumbfounded. They, they didn't know how to react to this. Um, and she kept yelling at them. And she said she was so angry. She kept cursing them. And, uh, and finally, they threw her back into the cell, and the next day they released her. I mean, it wasn't because she was yelling at them. Um, I think, you know, uh, the way was paved by the loo to get her out of there. But she she absolutely refused to accept the idea that they had any control over her at all. Well, you know, I, I, I like to think, at least in terms of World War II, I, I'm pretty well read, um, but one of the things I love about all your books, and this one in particular, is I get to discover people I just I had never even come across I before. Know. Joe Jard was one of them. So maybe use him as an example and tell us a little bit more about what he, what he does and like how the Louvre gets through this. Because the, the other thing, again, that's amazing is just this, let's face it, lots of museum eggheads get together and say, we're going to resist the Germans. And they're amongst the first. And, and I don't know, I, I just find that fascinating. Well, Jajard actually wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't really in a resistance organization, but he did. Resist. Well, he helped. Right? Yeah. He, well, he, he did. He resisted the Germans. Basically, Hitler wanted to get a lot of those, those, yeah. you know, the Mona Lisa. And, you know, yeah. he, he wanted to take them for Germany. And Jajard, uh, he was helped by uh, a German officer who was in charge of, of uh, um, you know, the treasures of, of yeah. the Louvre. Um, but he, they met the, between the two of them, they managed to keep Hitler from taking. Um, mm -hmm. I think the only two masterpieces that were finally sent to Germany, um, but he managed to uh, avoid um, that from happening. Um, the, the, the resistance organization, the Museum of Man Network, did a lot more than that. I mean, yeah. you know, they, they were involved in, in collecting intelligence, which she was a courier taking intelligence. Uh, they were involved in helping um, uh, French and American soldiers to escape. They were involved in uh, um, sending, um, it, they had a resistance newspaper. It was the first underground newspaper um, that the, of the French resistance. Uh, and, and Christiane was involved in that too. So they, they were paving the way for later resistance organizations. They were really one of the very, very, very first. Hey. And and most of them, unfortunately, because they had no they had no experience in doing yeah. any of this. Uh, most of them, um, the, certainly the the men, the male leaders were all rounded up and they were executed. 
Um, and a number of the women were, none of the women were executed, but they were sent to concentration camps. Uh, and Christiane managed, I think because of, of her arrest by the Gestapo early on, she was very careful after that because the, it, it, they, they knew who she was and she knew that, yeah. it, that she was, you know, she was in the line of fire. So she managed to make it through the war without, um, you know, being arrested again. Yeah, well, I, you know, again, I, I was just, I was shocked because, you know, as you point out in the book, like the Louvre, most of its collection is intact at the end of the war. And you, and you consider what the Nazis did yeah. everywhere else. Right. Not what? only was not only was it attacked, but, but they, they weren't damaged at all. I mean, right. yeah, I mean, the story is really fascinating. They, they ended up all over the place um, yeah. and uh, they managed to bring them all back and, you know. Yeah. And, and there's another woman involved with this. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to remember her name. Rose, I think, is her. Rose, Rose Swan. Yeah. Yes. Who's, yeah. who's, 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 you know, part of the Monuments Men story and right. told there. Right. Who's really involved in this. Right. And she, and she was, she was acting under the direction of Jacques Chajard. Um, so Jacques, Jacques Chajard was the guy, you know, in the, in the, he was the spider and the spider web went yeah, all over yeah. the place. Um, so I, I, I promise we're going to move on from World War II, but I am going to ask Wally's question because it's the same question that I had, which is, and I'm sure you wanted to look into this too, did she ever meet uh, Marie-Madeleine Fourcade, either during the war or afterwards? That's a good question. I would not be at all surprised if they met. I don't know. Um, I, I found no evidence. Um, but they're, they remind me of each other. The, the, Marie-Madeleine was much more... Um, I don't know. It, she wasn't as human as as Christiane. Christiane let it all hang out. Uh, Marie Madeleine was very aristocratic. Very, uh, you know, she was a spy. She was very much in herself. Um, but but Christiane was just like mm. out there. And uh, so I, I, I've often thought, who would I rather have dinner with or a drink with? It would be Christiane. By a mile, um, because she was so much fun. Uh, Marie Madeline was fascinating. I think she's scary as hell. I think she scared a lot of the guys that she worked with. Christiane, I don't. She made life difficult for uh, people, um, but um, I don't know that she scared anybody. Uh, is it my turn, Rick? It is, Chris. It is your turn. Oh, okay. You Take it away. Right. Someplace oh. great. I was going to move on from the war. Yes, that's why okay. I'm transitioning to you for that. So, <laughs> so uh, this, the war is over. The collections of the Louvre have been saved. Um, uh, she's at the Louvre, but but she has a much bigger stage to go to. So can you talk a little bit about how she's getting back to Egypt and, and what's happening there as she's kind of getting back to to where it's happening? Um, yeah, it, it's kind of convoluted. After after the war, she didn't for for a number of years. She didn't do all that much in Egypt. Um, she was busy. She had gotten married. She had a child. Uh, she was at the Louvre uh, full time, um, and then um, basically a lot a lot was going on in Egypt. Yeah. You know, after the war, uh, it was still being controlled by the Brits, um, but there was a lot of nationalism. There had been for a number of years. Um, you know, the Egyptian was, Egyptians were tired of being um, ruled by the British, to put it mildly. And um, so... I it, understand the feeling completely. Well, it's not. Good governance. Come on. Yeah. So in 1952, um, um, you know, a lot happened before that. But in 1952, um, a group of officers in the Egyptian army uh, led by... Uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser uh, staged a coup and uh, they took charge of Egypt. And it, it, this to me is just the most incredible uh, fact that Nasser was the first Egyptian to rule Egypt since Cleopatra in 30 BC. That from that time until he took over or his group took over, um, other nations had ruled uh, either indirect, either directly or yeah. indirectly, had ruled yeah. Egypt. So he was the first. He was the first one, and and basically from then on, you know, it was you know, get out. Um, he he summarily fired all the British and French officials who were still working uh, within the government. He he uh, took back the antiquities um, operation totally. It was under the Egyptians, um, which 
this this was caused an earthquake uh, among Western archaeologists, to put it mildly. Western it caused an earthquake among Western governments. What he did, and, and we don't have time to go into all the uh, the machinations, but you know they were not happy. They were not happy, and, and uh, so there was a lot of anti Nasser, anti Egypt feeling uh, in Britain, certainly in Britain, and certainly in France, and even in the United States. Um, so basically, so they th throw all the Western archaeologists out, but they want to establish their own major center for ancient Egypt. And they want a Western archaeologist to help with that. Mm -hmm. And so there's only one that they would consider, and that's Christiane uh, de roche Noble Corps. And so she came back to Egypt uh, and worked with UNESCO, in the, the new UN Agency for Cultural, Educational, and Scientific Operations to, to help Egypt set up this center. Um, and one of the reasons, there are many reasons why um, they chose her, um, is that throughout her time in Egypt, unlike many of her male colleagues, she actually worked with Egyptians. She liked yeah. Egyptians. She learned Arabic. Um, from the beginning of her her archaeological uh, experiences there, she was she always became she was always appointed as the nurse, in, you know, in the, on the dig. She would take care of uh, not only the other archaeologists if they had, you know, if they were bitten by a cobra or, um, um, you know, if they hurt themselves or whatever, but she also helped worked with the workers, um, and she took great pride in that. She didn't think that was that was that she 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 took great pride and and so she um continued so she worked very very closely with the egyptians not just not just the workers but the people in cairo um and uh the intellectuals in cairo so she knew them and, and they knew her and they liked her um so that's one of the main reasons they asked her to come back besides she was a brilliant archaeologist yeah. well so i also she, Go ahead. I, was just, I was just really impressed that, you know, even, you know, you have in the book some wonderful quotes from some of some of these workers. And, and these are the, the, the people that get written out of all the stories about. Right. They, and they sang her praises, you know, many years. Yeah. yeah. She would I, really from the beginning until she left. And, you know, as I said, she didn't leave until Egypt in terms of work until she was in her 70s and 80s. She would explain to the late the workers what they were doing, why whatever dig they were on, why that was important. She didn't treat them as peons. She didn't treat them as, you know, yeah. uh, subordinate. Um, and they really respected her. And, and, you know, the fact that she could speak Arabic, uh, yeah. even today, I don't think most, um, maybe I'm wrong, but, but, but most Western archeologists don't speak uh, the language of the, of the countries they're in. Um, so she was very unusual. I want to remind everybody that we're talking to uh, Lynn Olson, who is the author of Empress of the Nile, the daredevil archaeologist who saved Egypt's ancient temples from destruction. And let's talk about that. And to do so, I think we have to kind of shortcut a few things. Um, uh, Nasser wants to build and does build a huge dam, the Aswan Dam, uh, to dam the Nile River to provide power for people in Egypt, which he originally wants to have funded uh, from the West, but then uh, because of the war with Israel, the West bows out. It's going to be funded by the Russians. This is going to flood a whole bunch of ancient, wonderful uh, sites that are going to just be underwater, including perhaps the best known one, which is a temple here uh, in a very old picture uh, called uh, Abu Simbel. Uh, and and so she gets involved, more than gets involved, she becomes the linchpin of the effort to save this. Now, this is a huge story. I don't expect you to tell us the whole story, but give us a, a sense of of how how does she become how does she become the key person? And then what does she bring to that? What is she doing? Uh, that that's so spectacular to try to save these temples? Um, well, because she's in Egypt at this time, setting up this center, she's right there uh, when she finds, when Nasser announces the dam. 
And uh, instantly, everybody knows that all these temples are going to be destroyed, that they're going to be drowned if, not, if something isn't done. And nobody, nobody uh, thinks that, that can be done. It, it, it's just a fait accompli. Uh, the Egyptians said it's really sad, but we have to drown the past to have the future. Um, and so there's one person, one person who says, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. The, this is... This is not just Egypt's culture. This is the world's culture. This is your world's cultural heritage. You can't leave, lose those temples. Um, and so she's going around telling everybody this, and everybody thinks she's crazy. Um, that first of all, that it's impossible. They say technologically, um, and second, it would cost so much to even try that that it won't work. I mean, you know, there's, there are all these international tensions uh, in the world and the world isn't going to come to, the countries aren't going to come together to do anything like that. She was absolutely determined to do everything she could to try to make that happen. And so she, she's not the only one, I mean, who saved him, but she refused to give up just like she refused to give up on anything. Um, she finally, um, after years, I mean, we're, we're in a race against time here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, NASA announces this in the late 50s. They're going to start work in 1960, right in the beginning of 1960. And that dam the, is going to be built. And the water's going to rise. And she knew that. And so she, she, for, you know, a couple of years, she desperately was trying to get um, people involved. She finally got UNESCO to join, which was huge, which is enormously important because they really were, they really oversaw this campaign. Um, and then she persuaded the cultural minister of Egypt um, to also join in the effort. He was, he was a very uh, pro-Western uh, official um, in, the, in the government, one of the very, very few. Um, he spoke French, he had a PhD, um, and so he became an ally as well. But but they were kind of, you know, preaching in the desert and you know, not, not many people were willing to go along with that. And, and you also had, um, you also had the British, French and um, um, U.S. governments against this, against this project. Well, it, it took years. Finally, in 1960, UNESCO began a, a enormous um, uh, campaign and she's, one of the main uh, parts of this campaign to try to raise money and to convince people. Um, luckily, um, General Charles de Gaulle became president of France and, and he went along with it. And his cultural um, minister, Andre Malraux, the famous writer, uh, became a huge champion of saving the temples. Um, but it took, um, years and years and years and years to figure out a if they could do it and b to raise the money it, i mean it, it, it's a saga of you know it is a race against time because in 1960 they broke the uh the temple i mean the uh the dam was the construction started on the dam and uh, so they were desperately trying to figure out a could we save these temples these these temples especially the temple of abu Simbel that you showed um, they're made of sandstone, and sandstone is a very crumbly um, um, substance. And these are 3,000 years old. These temples are 3,000 years old. And Abu Simbel was carved into a rock, um, you know, a huge cliff, as you can see. Um, and nobody... And it's, I mean, it's, 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 a person would be, you know, a speck in this photograph. These Absolutely. things are humongously tall. Those, those four statues that you see there are uh, statues of Ramses II, who was the pharaoh who, who, who built that temple. Um, and they're 70 feet tall, each one of them. Uh, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll show a, 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 I mean, I'll give away the fact that it was moved. I think we've, we, we've established that, yeah. but just to yeah. see, so you can see the scale, this is, this That's is, that's what they were dealing with. That's, I mean, look at that. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. You can't see it very well, but you know, there there are statues below those massive statues. You know, of of of, of Ramsey's wife and children, and also, I mean, it's just an extraordinary uh, monument. And to how do you do it? And 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 that was um, the question for at least 
two years. And meanwhile, the dam is being built and the water is starting to rise. They finally um, figured out, or they they hoped that they uh, they finally decided that they were going to cut the uh, whole monument into blocks and then move it to a, a higher place back from the Nile. But nobody knew if it was going to work. In fact, nobody thought it was going to work. It was the only thing they could think of that might possibly have a chance of working. And mean, so, okay, they're going to do that. But meanwhile, they haven't raised the money. You know, they haven't raised all the money that they needed. They desperately needed the United States to come up with the majority of the money because otherwise there was no way uh, that that would be funded. I mean, we're talking about $80 million. I mean, it was huge amount of money that was needed. Um, and, you know, so, so they were trying to figure out if they could do it and then, you know, if they were going to have the money. So that took several years and she was in the middle of all of that. Well, I also, I, I was really impressed with you know, her you know, pushing that idea that this is something that belongs to the whole world. Because I think, you know, the backdrop of all this story is just all the political tension. Because, of course, earlier you had this little argument about a canal and who's going to run it. And there's right. a lot of it right. there. And we have the Russians building the dam. So Eisenhower doesn't want to support it. it the, the negotiating just the technical aspect of this would have been a challenge. But then you add in the whole political component. It shouldn't. It shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. No, I mean, you know, the idea that it actually did happen, um, but the she and the other organizers were blessed with the fact that John Kennedy was elected president in 1960, and he had a wife. Another uh, unknown hero in this story is Jacqueline Kennedy, who basically convinced John Kennedy to come up with the money, or at least to ask Congress to come up with the money for Abu Simbel. Um, she was very interested in this whole project and had been. Um, she had said at one point in, in during this that, that if she were a man, if she were a young man, that's where she wanted to be. She wanted to be an archeologist and to be working on this project. And, and uh, so behind the scenes, um, she did a huge amount uh, to persuade the Kennedy administration to come up with the funds. And in fact, um, they did. And, um, and meanwhile, so that, that allowed Abu Simbel, the attempt to save Abu Simbel. And that attempt was an extraordinary story too, because you had thousands of people from all over the world, engineers, yeah. workers, you know, from every every country, um, the Sweden, I mean, you know, it, they came to this very hot place um, in the desert to to save these temples. And again, they didn't know if it's going to work. You know, they would, they, you know, they, they would cut, you can see, they were cutting um, <clears throat> the faces right here of, of the uh, of, of the statues. And um, I mean, cut to the chase, it did work. They didn't lose anything of this uh, temple. Um, it, it was an extraordinary effort on the part of of a worldwide community of um, archaeologists, engineers, etc. And it was brilliant. And they managed to get it all done before um, the floodwaters rose and um, you know swallowed up the space where um, this gorgeous. Um, monument was and they moved it you said it's something like a tenth of a mile i mean they don't move it very far but it's 200 feet higher up right and and it's back it's yeah. back from from the nile so it 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 overlooks lake nasser which is the reservoir the enormous reservoir um you know in in a similar way that it did you know overlooking yeah. overlooking the nile. the fascinating thing there's so many fascinating things about this story, but the fascinating thing, most fascinating thing to me is that they managed to do something that is quite extraordinary. When Ramses II built that temple, his, his engineers, his architects, etc., cetera, um, they managed to build it so that on twice a year, when the sun came up um, across the Nile, that it, a beam of sunlight 
penetrated into the temple. The temple is interior, is, is inside that cliff. It penetrated the cliff, uh, penetrated into the temple, went all the way back to a sacred room in the back, which was um, a room with the statues of some of the most famous gods and Ramses. So there were four um, statues and that beam of light went back and, and lit up that room. Um, they figured that out. And so that was one of the things that the modern uh, engineers had to do is, is to replicate that. And they did. Um, twice a year, that beam of sunlight goes right through the temple and hits that room and illuminates those statues. Extraordinary. Uh, one of the, uh, we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe I, I could, could talk a little bit more about one of the things that I, I found so impressive about our heroine is that she had a real keen sense of of, of place and, and, and geography and, and that these weren't just objects that could go anywhere. So when they reconstructed the yeah. temple, it had to be a certain way. There's another uh, rescue effort you talk about where they have to recreate an island next to yes. where the temple is. And you talk about her stressing that to future archaeologists that you have to know something about the place. Right. To, so talk a little bit more about kind of her ties to Egypt and why, you know, the importance of place to her. And, and... Um, yeah, I think she had kind of a mystical, you know, a, you know, a, attraction to Egypt. Um, she felt when she was on a dig, um, she felt close to ancient Egypt because of the workers. She she considered the modern Egyptians to be true um, descendants of the ancient Egyptians. And I think that's one of the things she liked about socializing, uh, especially with the labor. She, 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 I think she wanted to be, uh, she would have loved to have been in ancient Egypt. Uh, in fact, a, a colleague of hers once said that, you know, he, it was a woman, another woman archaeologist who said she would have been very happy to have been Ramsey's um, vizier, you know, his, his, uh, yeah. his top official. Um, I think she can Considered herself to be, you know, kind of, I, I don't know. She, she just really loved Egypt. She constantly told her students, you know, when she was, she taught at the Ecole de Louvre, um, which is a school connected to, to the Louvre Museum. And, and she was an extraordinarily popular um, professor uh, mm -hmm. there. And, and she talked about how they, as you said, had to connect with Egypt that you, that it, it wasn't just a case of going over there and digging. You had to become part of it. You had to understand sure. it. You had to stand at the Nile, uh, at the banks of the Nile, and just communicate. Uh, you know, and, and you know, it, it was a very spiritual thing yeah. for her. And 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 so, and she couldn't stand it when her Western colleagues, some of her Western colleagues, clearly didn't have that. They they didn't have that love for the country. They, they might have loved archaeology and, and all that, but they didn't have that kind of communion um, with Egypt, both in terms of its, you know, the, the you know the physical part of Egypt, but also the people, both, both the the ancient Egyptians and the modern Egyptians. And as I said, she really considered the modern Egyptians <clears throat> to be like the ancient Egyptians. She felt like she was there. <clears throat> she, the, you know, that she was there in ancient Egypt when she was with them. And toward the end of her life, um, um, she, when she was in her 70s, I think, a, a friend of hers said to her, you know, is there any special place that you have over there? And she said that she couldn't stand anymore being at um, temples where there are a lot of tourists. She, she said, it's that's not Egypt to her, that the place that she felt most comfortable was in the Valley of the Kings, which is, you know, where most of the, um, the tombs of the pharaohs are, but not in the, not where, you know, the tourists are, not, not, not in those tombs. She felt most comfortable uh, in a path going in the back of the mountain um, where nobody goes. Um, mm. And she said it was only there, and this was late in her life, um, only there that she really felt 
uh, like she was in Egypt. Um, so you, you're absolutely right. She did have this incredible um, sense of, of place in terms of Egypt and she never lost it. Um, I think, you know, it was probably the saddest moment in her life when she, she got too old to, to be able to go and go back. You know, the, the saddest thing, well, there's a couple of sad things, but one of the, one of the things that really struck me in this story is we'd like to think that it, well, everybody wants to preserve historical monuments. And somebody asked a question, you know, why wasn't it self-evident to the Egyptians uh, that these should be preserved? But there were all sorts of people, both in this specific case of, of these temples in Egypt, who, who just didn't see it as that important. I mean, clearly right. the, the Soviets assisting with the dam didn't see it as very important. Egypt didn't see it as important. The United States, Britain, and France originally were, um, were we're standing off from helping because, well, well, we're unhappy with your political situation. We don't like the revolution that you've done. We don't like that you're, you know, in bed with the communists, so we don't want to have anything to do with you. And and to me, this is just, this all still goes on, right? I mean, oh, yeah. the, the struggle yeah. okay. to sounds, preserve yeah. right. our heritage is just right. so, it's 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 a never-ending struggle. That's right. That's right. And, and, and her idea, she wasn't the only one who had the idea, but... Um, Andre Moreau also, but the idea that that these treasures don't belong to Egypt, they don't belong to France, they don't belong to, to Britain, they belong to all of us. And, and she kept saying that over and over again. It's not a matter of, it's, a, a, it's for posterity, it's for our children, regardless of, you know, what country you live in. And, and that's, UNESCO took that and, and, and that's, you know, they made that, that thanks to her and others, um, that's how they set up the World Heritage, their Her World Heritage uh, program. Then that's the underlying idea. It's not, it's, it's everybody's culture. It should trump the politics, pardon uh, yes. the phrasing, but uh, it should, it should, it should override the politics of the moment or the wars of the moment, because this is, this is who we are. And if right. you don't, you know, and so little ends up getting saved, so much ends up being destroyed. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's like plowing the sea to try to just save a little bit of it. Well, one of the things that I'd just like to mention that, that I found very interesting, and I didn't really know this or really didn't think about it, is, is at the time when this was going on, especially in this country, in the U.S., it was the whole time of urban renewal, of, you know, bulldozing the past. It, so, so we were doing it too. We, mm -hmm. we, we, we destroyed uh, the, the beautiful Penn Station in New York, you know, which was a, a Beaux Arts masterpiece, and we ended up with that horrible underground cellar. Yeah, cellar. Um, so, you know, the new is good. I mean, it was very, 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 very important here, and and to some extent still is. The whole idea of preservation was 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 really nobody nobody wanted it, or very 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 few wanted it. So you know the fact that, that this actually occurred, that she was the spark plug, she was the linchpin for this, she got it started. A lot of people got involved as a result of it, but in fact, um, fifty countries did contribute money to saving it. Thousands of archaeologists from all over the world, thousands of engineers. It was a true um, international example of international cooperation. The, 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 probably the most incredible uh, example of international cooperation. It was also the largest ar archaeological rescue ever. Um, so that we that we did do it. So we did it, right? We pulled it off. Um, she pulled it off. The others pulled it off, but it. They did it. They did it, and it was a, it was a total success. Well, one of the, you know, as we're as we're kind of getting towards our time, I, there's so much we haven't covered because she goes on. Yeah. Um, but talk a little bit about about uh, kind of the legacy or the ripples of this. You know, we've been saying about how the historic preservation and and this idea, a lot of it seems to be coming from just the sensation of this international effort to save this temple. You, you, you talk about people from all over the world, yeah. small donations, big donations. It's, it, um, but 
the after effects of that and and that maybe you can maybe bring uh you know jackie kennedy back into that conversation too it, yeah it, it did have an enormous impact certainly uh, you know but the the world heritage i mean the, what unesco did that was that that was really enormous and that was a that came directly from this operation um one of the, one of the really interesting things is that you know if it hadn't been for her with this uh, um whole operation that the Metropolitan Museum of Art would not have the Temple of Dendor because the Temple of Dendor was one of those temples that was going to be destroyed. Um, and thanks, and, and in, as a thank you gift to the Kennedys for doing what they did, um, the uh, temple came to the United States a, as a gift. It was supposed to go, Jackie Kennedy, after John Kennedy was assassinated, desperately wanted it to come to Washington. Um, to be on the banks of the Potomac as part of the Smithsonian. Uh, the Met's very cagey, wily director, Thomas Hoving, managed to get it away um, from her and uh, it, it went to the Met. And one of the, one of the most poignant things for me in the book is that Jackie Kennedy uh, bought a uh, penthouse apartment right across the street from um, the Met years before that. And that from her apartment, she could look down and see the Temple of Dendor uh, in its glass case. Um, so, you know, it was a constant reminder of, of what she had done, but, you know, that it, she thought it was in yeah. the wrong place. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, we're, we're, we're just about at the end of our hour. I, went, I have one quick, I usually let Chris ask the last question. Yeah, but no. I, I, but, yeah. but I'm going to jump in here because, because have you inked the movie deal on this? I mean, is Marianne Cotard yeah, right. knocking at your door? I well, mean, this seems like a perfect Hollywood movie. Well, you know. Uh, you can't say, of course. Yeah, but no, 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 there is no, but it hasn't, the book hasn't been published yet. It's being published. On well, Tuesday. don't wait, Hollywood, to I all... You know, if if you're Marianne, if you're one of our our viewers or any other Hollywood producers, they get this. This is a a great movie, uh, international production. Maybe I'll option the rights and, and sell them off. Lynn. <laughs> uh, this has been so much fun. We want to thank uh, Lynn Olson for joining us today to talk about her book, uh, Empress of the Nile, the daredevil archaeologist who saved Egypt's ancient temples from destruction. And yes, we we have skimmed. Skimmed. Yeah, there, there's just so much Skimmed more here. this book. So uh, there's lots more there. It's terrific. It comes out on Tuesday. You can pre-order now. And uh, and and then you're, you've got a bunch of talks coming up. So what's your website uh, where people can find out where you're where where to find you and see you? It's lynnolson.com. There you go. So, That's Lynn, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining so us. Much, oh, this is a delight. As yeah, always. Yeah. always great to have Lynn Olson on, especially uh, uh, with this story uh, taking place in ancient Egypt or yeah. somewhat in modern Egypt and <laughs> the U.S. as well and all those different places. And and Nazis. Don't forget the Nazis. And there were Nazis, you know, because the Nazis is always good. You know, I would say there are Nazis in in at least 50 percent and maybe two thirds of our programs. A Nazi will make an appearance, mm -hmm. but we're not. <laughs> We're not. No, we are. We're on the other side. We would have some issues. Yeah. So speaking of uh, Nazis and the people who fight them, yes. our fellow uh, Ambrose historian Kevin Hemel is coming back. He's written a second volume in his Patton trilogy, and this mm -hmm. one starts the day that General Patton takes command of the Third Army, August first, nineteen forty-four, and continues until the relief of Bastogne in December of forty-four. Uh, so so it, covers, it covers when the Seventh Army came to his rescue, then, right? Uh, <laughs> I know that General Patton is one of your favorite figures. Our audience knows this, and so everyone will be uh, watching the program to uh, to see how you uh, yeah, how you handle yes how you handle this. But you know, oh, and I also yeah. want to say that the Ghost Army makes an appearance in this book. Of course, it does. Now, I did 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 that was that deliberately put in the book for you, Rick? Or I, I I'm, we're going to have to ask Kevin Hemel yeah, that question. I think it, I think we're going to say, yeah, did you but... did you make those mentions of the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops because you knew you were going to be on History Happy Hour and Rick Byer would ask you about it? And that's the first thing you look for in an index, isn't it? Well, after it my is, name. It is, it is, isn't it? it <laughs> after is, my yeah. name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, okay, everybody, uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, shout at us on Twitter, uh, listen to our podcast, because all of these shows are in a, in a podcast, and you can find out about it on our website. Back us on Patreon and browse our website, which is historyhappyhour.com. And we promise we're going to be live and in the flesh next week. Next week, and for, for many, although not all, of the weeks coming up, <laughs> in the uh, in the next few months so we are yes. we're going to be we, we've been on a ping-ponging live not live thing and we're starting to get back into more live so yes because rick misses you i do as do i but... i do i do okay be safe everybody